so. So it's going? It's going now. Okay. Yeah, yeah so I'll leave it like that. with the Climate Emergency Institute. I have my colleague here, Paul Beckwith, and we have Regina Valdez as well. Um, these sessions, these media reports, we're giving the latest news on the climate emergency, and this one is the Arctic climate emergency. I'll just say a few things before handing over to Paul Beckwith. Um, Arctic uh, feedbacks and tipping points threaten our survival. Um, a quote from Antonio Guterres, the UN Director General, pointing out that climate change is an existential threat to most life on Earth and particularly humanity, and that's very much because of the Arctic. I have to make a mention, of course, of the big, awful, terrible news yesterday that 2019 was yet another year, a record year for global fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions absolutely, absolutely terrible because all of the science has said for many years that by 2020 they must be declining. So this is, um, uh, this is, the, um, uh, this is the Global Carbon Projects. You see the emissions, CO2 emissions from 1990 there up to 2019. And if you take a look at their, uh, their record from 1960 to 2016, it's even more dramatic that we are on a route to planetary catastrophic collapse. And again, that's very much because of the Arctic. And so just to show one of the many images, this is from UNEP, that we have to decline our emissions in order to survive by 2020. And the science has been definite on that for years. Pass over to Paul. Thank you, Peter. So I think it's uh, becoming pretty clear that uh, you know the Arctic is changing faster than just about any other part of the planet. And many years ago, I came up with the phrase, "What happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic," because Arctic changes have global uh, effects and global implications. So first and foremost, we have the Arctic temperature amplification effect. So as uh, just as we mentioned in our last um, press conference, uh, we this year we're heading to have a, global, a an average annual temperature increase globally of 1.1 degrees Celsius relative to the 19th century. That equates to 1.4 degrees Celsius increase relative to the pre-industrial baseline 17, year 1750, which is what the 2 degree and 1.5 degree uh, Paris numbers are, are based on. They're relative to the pre-industrial level. So, and in fact, when we had a strong, powerful El Nino in 2015-2016, in, in February of 2016, for that month, 
we were 1.6, almost 1.7 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial for, for, for that month. So, but now we're, we're, we're for a whole year, we're, we're approaching that 1.4 degrees Celsius number. Why is the Arctic amplifying temperature so much compared to the global average? Well, the Arctic is a very high reflectivity, high reflective place because snow and ice reflects a lot of sunlight. So the sunlight hits the snow and ice and reflects back up into space. But as we lose the Arctic sea ice, we're replacing that bright white ice with dark seawater. As we lose the, and that's decreasing in September is at a rate of about 12.9% per, per decade. Um, snow cover on the land area surrounding the Antarctic is decreasing at 22% per decade for the spring months, so, so May, June. Um, so making the Arctic much, much darker. And because the Arctic is much, much darker, it's absorbing all that additional sunlight and it's warming like crazy. So this, like I said, has global implications. So the jet streams exist on our planet because we have a cold pole and we have a warm equator. So raise the temperature significantly of the pole and you reduce the temperature difference to the equator. And that means the jet streams, the physics of it means the jet streams have to slow down and become much wavier. And when they do, they've been doing that, and thus the incidence of extreme weather events, the frequency of occurrence, the severity and the duration of extreme weather events have, has, has greatly increased. Another thing that happens is as the jet stream becomes very, very wavy, the troughs of the jet stream go down as far as far as the um, equator, actually, and the jet streams even even combine with jet streams in the southern hemisphere. And the ridges of the jet stream that carry heat and dryness north extend up as far as the Arctic in the middle of, of the winter. Okay, so we can have the North Pole above zero degrees Celsius in the middle of the winter, complete darkness, because the jet stream ridge has carried that heat up there. So the other thing that happens is, think of the jet stream and what it circulates around in the Northern Hemisphere. Okay, it circulates around the North Pole, a little bit offset towards Greenland, but basically if you take the, all the cold area in the Arctic and kind of calculate the center mass of it or the centroid of it, it's just south of the North Pole. Now what happens in a world where there's no sea ice? So we talked about the first event being a blue ocean event. You know, so maybe within five years you won't have any sea ice in a September. Um, and then, so anyway, think of what's gonna be up there. The only cold area up there with no sea ice is obviously Greenland. The center of Greenland is 73 degrees north, lat latitude 73 degrees north. So it, it, it doesn't take a big stretch of the imagination to think, okay, when there's no sea ice in the Arctic at all, why would the jet streams continue to circulate about the North Pole? No, those, the, the center of cold is the center of Greenland, so the jet streams will circulate about Greenland, and therefore not only do the jet streams slow down and become wavier, uh, but the entire, the entire nature of the jet stream will shift they're gonna be offset from the North Pole towards Greenland, bringing much more powerful ridges of coal down over North America, and completely, you know, the, the system, the circulation system of the, which is the atmosphere of the oceans, are, are basically gonna be rewired. And this is a huge problem to all of humanity because we have to grow food and it's going to completely change our ability to grow food in different regions. Regions where we could grow it before, we will no longer be able to grow it. In fact, many areas of the planet will start to become uninhabitable, basically. And we talk about uninhabitable regions on Earth, people think mostly of places like the, you know, the Middle East, for example, where the Red Sea or something is getting approaching that 35 degrees Celsius temperature, and when it reaches that temperature, 
the, the, temp, the, con, the weather conditions along the coast are 35 degrees Celsius or higher with 100% humidity. And this is a wet bulb temperature. This is a limit of human survival. So people won't be able to live outside or be outside for more than six, eight hours before they get heat exhaustion and heat stroke and, and uh, die if they're not brought into colder conditions. We also could talk about maybe some Caribbean islands becoming uninhabitable. You know, what happens when the jet streams are so slow that the Category 5 hurricanes meander along and actually stall over a Caribbean island, like, like Grand Bahamas or Abaco Island, for example. You know, and we have hurricane force, Category 5 winds over, over a Caribbean island for two days solid. I mean, nothing, no infrastructure can survive. Um, so what are a couple other things? Well, obviously Greenland doesn't take a rocket scientist or a climate scientist to realize that with no Arctic sea ice and a much warmer Arctic, that the melt rates from places like Greenland will greatly accelerate. In fact, the doubling period, every, every about nine or 10 years, the melt rates from Greenland and Antarctica double. And this has been happening for, for many, many doubling periods, you know, at least the last two decades. You know, this was in a famous James Hansen paper. So if you continue that rate, well, obviously, you know, no sea ice in a much warmer Arctic, you know, there's nothing going to be stopping Greenland melt rate. It's going to be greatly increasing. And also, we, we have the big methane situation. We have lots of methane in the Eastern Siberian Arctic shelf. The, the water is shallow. It's only 50 to 100 meters deep. And the, per the sediments on the seafloor get perforated and we're getting methane bubbling up from those areas. We're getting lots of methane coming up from the land permafrost. Look at the Siberian Yadoma Peninsula. We're getting huge huge uh, craters being formed by methane coming up causing explosions and people are reporting you know bursts of light in the distance and so on um, so these things are all feeding back and I guess the point is is you know you, we're not always going to be in, we're losing control of our ability to actually do anything about it if the more we talk about doing something and do the least then we're losing that window of opportunity to make huge change without completely revamping everything. Uh, because all, as the ecosystem changes, the emissions increase from the Earth itself. And those will dwarf any human emissions. Uh, just one last point. There's five gigatons of methane in the atmosphere right now, total. And if 50 giga, if a 50 gigaton burst of methane, as Peter Wadhams has discussed in a paper a few years ago in the Arctic, that would increase the level of methane in the atmosphere by a factor of 10. I mean, we're talking about huge amounts of methane in the permafrost and hundreds. So, so we can't, you know, there are people that are talking about climate restoration ideas, and a big part of climate restoration is, you know, can, can we cool the Ar Arctic? So here we have to slash fossil fuel emissions, but that's not sufficient. We also have to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, and we have to deploy technologies to try to cool the Arctic and keep, the, keep everything, keep, keep the order in our, in our weather patterns and systems intact so that we can continue to grow food on this planet. Thank you.